Good morning, everyone. This is Chaitali Bagh from the European Bureau of Aviation and Defense Universe based out of Cyprus. Today, on the 75th Infantry Day, we have with us Lieutenant General Sanjay Kalkarni, former Corps Commander, 14 Corps, who retired as DG Infantry and the most exciting information I want to share with my viewers is that he was the first officer to have landed with his troops on the Siachen Glacier. The day was 13th of April, the year 1984, and the destination, Bella Fonla. And what better than listening to the gripping story of Indian Army landing on the highest battlefield in the world from the man who jumped from the helicopter, landed on the glacier, and created history. Sir, welcome to ADU's chat room. And now I request editor Sangeeta Saxena to steer the conversation ahead. Thank you very Thank much, you. Atali. Thank you very much. And sir, it's a pleasure to welcome you here on ADU's chat room. No better day to recall this history and no better person to hear it from. It's right from the horse's mouth. But sir, today is a very special day. So it's also Infantry Day. And uh, before we begin with your story of Siachen Glacia, we'd like to begin by asking you, why 27th October is Infantry Day? Firstly, uh, Jai Hind, a very happy Infantry Jai Hind, Day. Sir. And uh, since I happen to be from the Kumau Regiment, it also happens to be the Kumau Day. And uh, not just that, since uh, Major Somnath Sharma, the first PVC was also from my own battalion, Fokumau. So uh, it's a, a day which we all tend to celebrate, the whole nation celebrates today as the Infantry Day. Now, just a brief background to why uh, 27th October uh, was chosen as the Infantry Day. Because Infantry is as old as uh, human beings are, because uh, everyone, the moment the human beings are born, they're bound to fight with one another. So Infantry, in some form or the other, you require uh, you know boots on the ground to defend yourself. Why the 15th of October was chosen is important. The 15th of August 1947 was the chosen as the Independence Day, primarily because Lord Mountbatten always thought that the surrender of the Japanese was on that day of the 15th of August. And then June 1947, the British government decided to grant independence to India. And it was to be given in around June of 1948, but pre-pawned to the 15th of August, 1947, primarily because of Lord Mountbatten's, uh, uh, you know, the, the chosen date because of the surrender of the Japanese. Having said that, when June 1947 got to be known as, yes, this is, India is going to be divided into two countries, Pakistan and India, Muhammad Ali Jinnah will be staying in Aurangzeb Road. 10 Aurangzeb Road for the residence of Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Mountbatten and Maharaja Hari Singh were to be, had served together on a cross and they knew each other very well. And Maharaja Hari Singh, since he was dilly dallying on aspects of wanting uh, Kashmir to be an independent country. So Mountbatten obviously went, being an old friend of his, he was invited and he did not have very good relations with Pandit Nehru, Maharaja Hari Singh. And Maharaja Hari Singh and Mountbatten were very good friends. Obviously, for the Maharaja, he, he was the ruler of this thing, and the British paramount was supposed to end. So, when uh, Mountbatten when he went there, he told uh, Maharaja Ali Singh, "Look, independence is out of the question. You have to choose only between India and Pakistan. That the government of India does not mind you choosing Pakistan. You can do what you want to do, but choose and decide to choose, and you have to choose. You cannot dilly dally, and you cannot just about to sit down wanting to be, get independence. It may not work out." because it's impossible. So having said that, and uh, Mountbatten wanting to meet him on the last day of his trip in uh, Srinagar, that was probably the third or the fourth day, Maharaja Hari Singh you know, said that he couldn't meet him and the Prime Minister met him and uh, anyway, Mountbatten came back. When he came back, after that again, and now all this is happening around the June of 1947 when things were quite clearer. As I said, Jinnah was staying in Delhi. He was staying in Ormila Blaine. Now, people knew from the uh, army, the army uh, strength had reduced. Practically, it was not even, over, not even about 4 lakhs of the army, or the combined two countries, which had to be divided. So you could safely say about 1.5 lakhs went to Pakistan. The balance of it came down to India. So it was a balanced army that existed between the two countries. The planning, because 
the uh, Muslim officers had sensed that Maharaja Ali Singh was really darling, and they, that the state of Jammu and Kashmir had predominantly Muslim population, comprising almost 70% of the population of Muslim. They wanted it. They weren't sure to show. They signed a standstill agreement with Maharaja Ali Singh. India refused to sign a standstill agreement, and all this was there. However, when the planning was going on, there was a person by the name of Akbar Khan, Colonel Akbar Khan. He's the man who actually now gains importance. He used to be visiting Jinnah in Delhi in 10 hours in the bay. He was serving in the army headquarters, then known as the general headquarters in Delhi. And the plan was worked out that should the Maharaja not do what we are wanting him to do, we would now execute a plan. Now, all that planning which was to be executed subsequently the 15th of August was thought of, pre-decided, planned, and was to be executed only after the independence was to be given. Now, G General, the Colonel Akbar Khan, who later uh, was known as General Tariq, eh, as part of Operation Gulmer, organized the entire invasion of Kashmir by the raiders. Now, this invasion had commenced much earlier, and around the 22nd of October, when this thing invasion had started, the planning had commenced there in Delhi that what could be done. Maharaja Arisi was clearly told until and unless he signed the instrument of exception, nothing would move. The Indian troops are not going to move, be what it is. He kept saying that the raiders are coming. You know, his own chief of staff, Brigadier Rajinder Singh, had now before the 26th of October had already been killed. So there was chaos, there was pressure. The standstill agreement with Pakistan, Pakistan stopped giving them all logistic aid. Therefore, there was a tremendous amount of pressure. Anyway, Maharaja Hari Singh signs the instrument of accession on the 26th of October, 1947. When he signs this, before this, at this point of time, General Rajinder Singh Ji was the GOC Delhi area. And General Russell was the army commander of then known as the Delhi area, the Delhi and East Punjab. So he was the army commander of this huge thing which comprised of what is present today, Delhi, uh, Punjab, Haryana, Himachal Pradesh. And once the operation started, JNK became a part of it. Now this is, I'm referring to the 26th of October, when all of these people were generally celebrating things at Jimkhana Club. At 9 o'clock at night, they were told that, look, the raiders have reached Baramula, and the next day morning, Probably maybe in Srinagar. And with that, and Jinnah has moved from La Karachi to Lahore to celebrate the Eid in Srinagar. So Eid was the same, 26th, 27th of October, and everything had been planned for. The Jinnah would be celebrating Eid, and things had been planned, executed very well, and everything had happened. And the raiders were at Abbottabad, the Pakistan's National Academy for Military, where your Osama bin Laden was being kept. By, by them, same place you find these raiders were also kept by Pakistan, equipped over four to five thousand of them had been raided, had been equipped with not only small arms, but with arms, what the infantry has, with, with mortars, MMGs, LMGs, and all of it, and not just small arms, but in general parlance, an AK-47, not just AK-47, but all other heavy arms also they make equipped. Now, having done this, the 27th of October, all this, 26th of October, late in the evening at 9 p.m. at Jim Khanna Club, they were told, come on, let's gather at the army headquarters, or else the Kashmir, the Kashmir has, the raiders are already at Paramur. The Pakistan army is aiding them. One General Tariq is supposedly organizing Operation Gulmurk. Jinnah has done all this, and let's now move. 27th of morning. And before this, General Russell had, because of the riots that had broken out, because of the partition between India and Pakistan in Delhi, Punjab, all over. So this Delhi area and all of it were under tremendous pressure. So there was a battalion which was spread all over, guarding, ensuring that Delhi doesn't get affected by the riots. But notwithstanding, he had visited, General Russell had visited one Sikh. So first Sikh, which were located then at Gurgaon, under Colonel Ranjit Singh Rai, he picked it up because when he visited the battalion a fortnight back, he found this officer to be very upcoming and you know, bubbly with energy, Josh. So when this planning was done in the night, he said, come on, let's pick up one Sikh from Gurgaon and send them tomorrow, the very next day, to Sri Lanka. Now, at this point of time, the Air Force had only two decoders. That's all that we, the Air Force had. But in India, the civil aviation all combined had about 30-odd decoders. So they gathered about seven on the morning of the 27th of October at Palam Airport and in the night 
At nine o'clock, this meeting is taking place. Around maybe about ten or eleven, they would have told Colonel Rai that please lift your battalion, be at the Palam Airport at four o'clock in the morning to be flown into Srinagar because the raiders have reached Baramula and they are just about to getting in. And should you find that you cannot land in Srinagar, please land in Jammu. We will organize for your vehicles and then drive down from Jammu to Srinagar, and that would have been the thing. But all these orders were given. Everything was planned for. Colonel Rai moved with battalion, less two companies. Those two companies were still guarding Gurgaon. Now, this, this his entire battalion was in Gurgaon. Now, Brigadier Katoch was nominated as the brigade commander, and to him was given one Sikh, one Kumau, and four Kumau. These are the three battalions placed under him to be for this operation in Srinagar. So, on 27th of October, the first military operations post independence were conducted by one Sikh. Which landed at Srinagar airfield, and it wasn't as bad as they thought. The raiders were still at Baramula. They hadn't reached there because, unfortunately for Pakistan, must that they have chosen the raiders from the northwest frontier province of the kind that they wanted it. They done it, but when they saw the wealth in Baramula, when they saw the women in Baramula, when they saw these properties in Baramula. They got distracted for the main aim of wanting to hit Srinagar and got involved in looting, raping, and all that they did at Baramula, and that prevented them from reaching Srinagar on the 27th of October and enabled the aircraft to land. Seven decoders could be organized for that particular day, and the first landing that took place was at uh, Srinagar airfield. So Srinagar airfield was secured, and thereafter one company he left over there and he moved up. To Baramulla, that's where he did an operation because they were then to pull out from Baramulla and he found that his he had only 200 men with him and the raiders were over 4,000 and all of them were equipped with wonderful weapons. All of them had infantry weapons and none other than the entire Park Army was behind them. As I said, out of the, the three to four lakhs of the Indian Army at that point of time, almost 50 50 it was divided between Pakistan and India and the Pakistanis that then. And how would one got to know? Six by 13 frontier force, some people were caught. And six by 13 frontier force was the battalion in which General Russell had served for 20 years. He was absolutely shocked that his own battalion was now involved in where he was the army commander here, this side, and his own battalion on the other side fighting. And therefore, the hand of the Pakistan army in that initial operations in Kashmir were revealed. That Pakistan army was very much there. Jinnah was very much involved in the entire operation. Akbar, Colonel Akbar Khan by then had been called General Tariq was none other than the, the Pakistani general who was part of uh, the entire uh, United India Army is concerned. And that is how you find that 27th October then got to be in print as the infantry day because first operations, post-independence and the securing of the airfield and rest is all history because once the Srinagar airfield was with us, we could land in as many troops as we could, and subsequently had Brigadier Katoch also wounded the very next day uh, with a sniper. He was pulled out. Then you had Brigadier L.P. Sain, who later became Lieutenant General L.P. Sain, called Bogi Sain, who was in command of 161 Brigade. Another brigade was under one Brigadier Paranspe, who was then undertaking a 50 para brigade by road from Gurdaspur, which was then to come to Jammu, and he was then to take it by road to Srinagar. So, with that as a backdrop, now you know why 27th October were chosen as an infantry day for not just the first operation post independence, but also having secured the Srinagar airfield and ensuring that where Jinnah had plans of celebrating his Eid was totally foiled by the troops of one Sikh. And then subsequently, on the 3rd of November 1947, Major Somnath Sharma, while defending the Srinagar airfield where the raiders had now passed through Baramula, Patan, and had almost reached the outskirts of the Srinagar airfield for the defense of the airfield. He was given the first Paramir Chakra. Colonel Ranjit Rai lost his life in pulling out, pulling his troops out from Baramula to Patan. He was awarded the first Mahavi Chakra. Brigadier Rajinder Singh, who later on took over and ensured that the troops, were, the raiders stayed at Baramula for some time, was also awarded the Mahavi Chakra. So all these operations that continued, and you now find the bitterness that exists between India and Pakistan continues of not today, but it's been on since 1947 and continues till today because of the anti-India, hate India, 
the desire to capture Kashmir, which never wanted it. And at that point of time, even Sheikh Abdullah decided that he would be with India. He ex accepted to be with India. And the instrument of accession, which got signed, had nothing to do with Article 370. It had nothing to do with 35 Alpha. It had everything to do with an instrument of accession, which was the same, which was signed by all the princes and rajas and maharajas of the rest of the 500 plus uh, principalities of India. The same instrument of accession was signed by uh, Maharaja Hari Singh. And therefore, we have the state of Jammu and Kashmir as part of India, and for which if we carry on, Pakistan doesn't seem to have reconciled that how is it that they lost? How is it that Jinnah could not celebrate Eid? How is it that uh, nothing of the Pakistanis that they planned from June of 1947, being in Delhi and executed in uh, October, having uh, raised almost 5,000 riddles, equipping them with modern weapons, training them, equipping and bringing the regular Pakistan army, join them, and still they, they failed to go beyond Baramullah. And the, uh, the uh, names that you hear, Uri, Kunj, Patan, Baramula, Srinagar, are all the names where battles took place. And after the Srinagar appeal, then of course was the Battle of Shalatan, and then the hold of the Indian army and the, the complete government on the state of JNK, less what is now with Pakistan called the Pak occupied Kashmir, which continues. And also, of course, the part of Aksai Chin, which is now with uh, China, which is part of the erstwhile state of JNK, which is uh, with them. So that is now its history. So now I could tell you, ma'am, why 27th of October was chosen as an infantry day. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. It was just wonderful a narrative. You know, it's got those so many nitty gritties and those so many inside stories, which we had never heard. We just know that two liner that because the troops landed, that is why. I think that was just wonderful. Before I continue, I had one very small question to ask. When I was doing my Reiki and research, sir, I realized that you've had some academic background of Karachi, Clifton Road. Uh, what is that? Uh, say again, ma'am. Uh, you had, I, when I was doing my Reiki and research, I realized that there's a little story about you having lived in Karachi on Clifton Road. Is that true? Uh, Yes, ma'am. Very much. I we stayed on the Clifton Road, and uh, I studied in Karachi for initial school, uh, career of my schooling in a school called Wendy School, which is not very far from Clifton Road. Where but this is post independence. This is post independence. Yeah. yeah. No, okay. my, my father. My father was posted uh, those days. I was a uh, child studying in the school, and right, uh, right. that's how oh, Clifton yeah. Road, which is generally occupied, you know, they call the VVIPs of. Yes. Uh, yes. The, uh, Karachi lot staying over there and uh, I have good memories of eating chana chur garam and you know <laughs> not, not what you call the 7-Up uh, 7-Up <laughs> as a drink and all these uh, this thing it was a good time I think we yeah. had very good uh, relationship with Pakistan at that time but the mindset of Pakistanis hadn't changed because I remember even then uh, Ayub Khan uh, who was a Pathan and also the chief of the army staff of Pakistan, who later became the, uh, uh, well, the ruler, or I could say the president or dictator of Pakistan. He also, when he uh, launched 65 operation, he also almost had the same thing. He would say he would have his uh, lunch uh, in uh, breakfast at Lahore. He would have lunch in Amritsar and he would have want to have dinner in Delhi. That's the kind of thinking that these people have had and they've been given rubbing one after every time and what happened in 71 is all known but that's probably the reason why you have Pakistan hell-bent in bleeding India with a thousand cuts because they haven't yet taken the defeat the stride in which they should have taken they always felt that they were a martial race and that they were a, a shade much much better they considered themselves 10 feet tall and they didn't think that Indians uh, the Hindus, because that is the word that the Pakis used. You know, they used to, we used to call uh, the Muslim uh, with some other name, and they would address Hindus as Baniyas. That means uh, nothing but the Hindus were a trading community and that they were not a martial race and that we could do what we wanted to do, that it was their bad luck that they could not do it in 47. And again, they didn't seem to realize it was again. They feel that it developed in 65 also. 
and again their bad luck in 71 also so they have not reconciled and we have a problem because of pakistan right. mindset right yes, sir ma'am. and uh, sir now uh, the next question will be on the most important event of your life and the most important thing for us indians that you landed on the highest battlefield in the world and uh, you know that really is a story of a lifetime you live the story so let's hear about it well at the very outset i must uh, be able to tell you well it's not me we be honest about it is not me because i just happened to be there anybody could have been there it's not that uh, anybody i think uh, army officers anybody could have done a better thing than uh, me also firstly secondly it's all about men it's all about men it, they were not to do what they have been told to do or what they have been trained to do and that that, that uh, you know that josh in them that desire that determination that kind of uh, thing if it is not there in men if it is there in men it rubs on to you in fact it rubs on because they are larger in number and you are a single soul so or maybe two of them so you have your one or two officers and you are a large number of troops under you if there uh, high morale their determination their desire their zeal their commitment it rubs on to you know you just cannot say uh, you can't step back now you have to either step along with them or be a step ahead of them to be able to take them along that you can do it because you are the ones who can do it now having said that so the credit must go entirely go to the troops of fokumo again as i said uh, 1947 the 3rd of november it was fokumo which happened to have uh, part of to save the shrinagar airfield on which major somnath sharma got the first paramvir chakra again in siachen we were fokumo it is so that we were in uh, dehradun in 1982 and we were told that we were to move to ladakh and that is how we moved into uh, initially at patalik and subsequently the place called turtuk now turtuk is an area which uh, we captured in 1971 and it is part of baltistan and uh, that is where and in as part of the karachi agreement there is a, a ceasefire line because now it is of course known as the loc those days it was called the ceasefire line cfl and the cfl was then drawn during the karachi agreement which ran along chalunka went to the uh, group of heights called co and there it said then northwards that is along this altoro ridge line going right up to karakoram 2 the k2 is the world's second highest peak and uh, that is all and then subsequently came the similar agreement which again mentioned the cfl by now 71 the ceasefire line had become the line of control and also changed because uh, in, uh, in uh, during the karachi agreement turtuk was part of the pok but by 71 now turtuk was part of us so now the cfl uh, the loc ran along turtuk and came down to a place called chalunka and then went up to kor and nj9842 now that's the place nj9842 and then stockwards now entire area there had not been uh, sort of uh, you can say virgin lands nobody had been there it was extremely difficult because it was absolutely glaciated heights were as high as 20000 feet and it was uh, i would say a mountainous paradise and that's what that entire area could be called and by 1963 pakistanis had uh, uh, gifted a place called shakstam which is adjoining the siachen glacier which has the khunjara pass through which runs the karakoram highway which is part of the cpc now which runs to gwada now you see the connection that are taking place of how things are moving now now you find that shakstam had been gifted by pakistan to china to set this border dispute in 1963 we had got a rubbing in 1962 and the shakstam and the siachen pakistan was sponsoring international expeditions towards all these peaks of taramsher and all these glaciers that carried on now we got to know of it obviously through the national geographic and alpine journal whenever the mountaineers visit all these places they invariably then bring out how difficult it was how the uh, you know uh, the ropes have to be put and things of those kind colonel inkuma who was then the commandant of the uh, high altitude warfare school located at gulmar he happened to have met a german friend of his who had who while in his conversation said who had was with him earlier in a one of these rafting expeditions but this time he used to climb a particular peak and he mentioned it to him that he was going there he said where are you going so he opened his map and said he was going here 
girl and kumar got a surprise is you going here but this is our area how come uh, uh, we said no no pakistan is a sponsor and so i'm going from the pakistan side and pakistan is been sponsoring expeditions via siachen to bela pondla in 1978 uh, and before that 73 and for and it will be carrying on until such time for so and this Pranay Kumar, being a mountaineer himself, was wise enough to understand that something had gone wrong. Meanwhile, the American embassy had written the American embassy in Delhi had written to Washington to say that the government of India is not in agreement with the kind of maps that we print about Jammu and Kashmir. Would you please clarify what are these maps all about and what of it belong to India? What of it belong to Pakistan, POK, or whatever they call it? But we are under pressure because the government of India doesn't accept it. Acknowledge all that is happening, so it went to a geographer in Washington, and the geographer there was one Mr. Hudson, who, without knowing the complications of it, decided to join NJ NJ nine eight four two with Karakaram Pass. He said, "Okay, let's draw, let's draw a line. Easier for aerial identification for aircraft to fly, so that it's easier for them to know which side is Pakistan, which side is China, which side is India. So you just draw a line without knowing the implications of it. Now." If you draw a line between uh, from NJ nine eight four two to straight to the Karakaram Pass, then you cede the entire Siachen Glacier, the Sakskum Valley, the entire area to Pakistan. Now that is the implication, which probably the geographer of United States, sitting in Washington, not aware of the ground realities, didn't understand and drew the line. Pakistan took full advantage of it. Then what we refer to that as the cartographic aggression. So this. The Pakistanis and the Americans at that point of time, Pakistan was a frontline state of America, was part of the uh, SATO, CENTO, and all kinds of uh, you know a non-NATO ally, and all that was happening within Pakistan because Pakistan was helping the United States to get closer to China. So Pakistan was virtually uh, well. Americans were buying from their palm, and Pakistanis were having a good time. So when all this was being done, suddenly when Colonel N. Kumar brought this to the notice in 1977-78. And he then was called to the army headquarters, and General Rana was the chief of the army staff. Now, General Rana was a Mahavir Chakra, uh, you know, Chushul fame. Both uh, General Rana was a Kumauni, Colonel and Kumar again a Kumauni. Uh, when I say Kumauni, I mean the regiment. So they all the same regiment, all all of them. So he was then told to go and meet General Chibba, who was then the director of military operations, who was also known to him. Uh, to Alain Kumar and I told him what is it like. He said, "Look, this is what it is, and I feel that they discussed it and they came to a conclusion that yes, Pakistanis were sponsoring expeditions to Siachen along Bela Pondla, which is the easy route of ingress for them to come in and Siala. So that is where and all of it. So he he was told how to go about it. He said, 'Don't worry, I will lead since I'm a mountaineer and uh, also heading a mountaineering institution. I will lead.'" Officers and men of mountaineering, so it will be seen as a mountaineering, not as poaching or anything like that. Time, but at least we'll show our presence. So that started with the presence in 1978, and then continued till 1980, and then subsequently in 1982, we got involved. Since I said 1982, uh, my battalion came down to Turtuk. I was uh, part of that uh, entire battalion, and then uh, there was a, a operation called. Uh, Ibex hunt, which was being done by Ladakh scouts, they would stay on the glacier for about two three months, come back, so the presence was being shown. Pakis would fly the aircraft sometimes. Pakis would come on the communication net sometimes, abuse and say that this is our land and this is that. Is it. But finally, nailed when the Pakistanis in 1983 uh, put a small uh, paper at the base camp to say, like as per the Karachi agreement, the Uh, line is NJ nine eight two two. Then northwards doesn't mean it goes there. It goes to Karakaram Pass. This is what it is, and you have now done this. So it, it is better that in the interest and of the two countries that you pull back your troops and you are not to be seen on this glacier again. It is our territory. Having said that, in nineteen eighty three, we decided that in eighty four again uh, this thing was to go. So eighty three, I was part of the polar bear. All the way, and I spent about three, four months. Uh, so I was going up to Bela Fonda, coming back. So I had familiarized myself with this uh, entire area. So what about? So obviously, because I had familiarized with the area, uh, you know, '84 it fell on me. Okay, now okay, now in '84 also we intend to do that, and you will now lead the patrolling uh, district. I said perfectly fine. So we'll do. 
So for which General Hoon, who was then the corps commander at uh, Srinagar, who also was a mountaineer, who also had been associated with, uh, was associated with high altitude warfare school at Kulma. So he said, look, if we were to plan operations over here, it would not be possible to launch with the kind of equipment that we have. All these years, these boys of ours have been going in around in the month of August uh, or July later. Then that time, the things are a little different. But if you intend launching them a little earlier, I don't think this equipment will see their through and the troops will suffer. The similar kind of opinion was expressed by the corps commander in Pakistan. And that is revealed by, in the book of the, written by Musharraf in the line of fire. He said the corps commander then was also interested to launch operations in, in the month of March. He said not possible because all the troops will die. Because once the Indians deinducted in 83, we sent our SSG on top of Siachen. They couldn't live and they had to be pulled back. I know that if the SSG had to be pulled back, launching operations on Siachen is impossible. Let's forget it. All this Musharraf was a learner colonel was posted in the Evo branch in 1983-84 and he was purview and listening to all the conversations that were taking place. But this is the core commander then of Pakistan army decided it could be done. He got changed and the new core commander had come because the earlier one retired, the new one took and he said it will be the 1st of May we will launch operations and that. And when General Hoon went to abroad to pick up the equipment for us because he said this, he realized that the Pakistanis had bought the entire old wear clothing from Europe and that nothing available. So they found out who's picked up all these. He said, the so Pakistanis came and lifted all of it. My God, no, by, this is December. By December of 1983 or the January of 1984, Pakistanis had already bought the entire uh, equipment which could sustain people at minus 40 degrees and could also prevent their eyes from getting snow blindness and you know headaches and all kinds of things. All clothing, the work clothing from Switzerland, England, France, Italy, wherever they could find Austria, everything had been picked up and now it was it. However, we were told that we would now launch operations on the 13th of April, 1984. Now, why 13th of April, 1984? Because then commander, who was Brigadier Channa, who, who said, well, 13th is the most auspicious day because it's Baisak. And he said, there cannot be any more anything more auspicious for India than Baisak. Now, he was a Kashmiri Pandit. <laughs> so for him, it was a lot to do with uh, the most auspicious day. Now, General Hoon also was a Kashmiri Pandit. Now, all of these people were, uh, you know, the same. Mrs. Indira Gandhi also was the Prime Minister at that point of time. So they all knew each other very well. And General Cheba was also commanding Jackalai. He was the colonel of the regiment of Jackalai. So his association with uh, Jammu and Kashmir, the General Hoon being a Kashmiri, otherwise from the Dogra regiment, Bigger Channa, Kashmiri, but from the Guard Regiment, he said, no, no, 13th April is a very auspicious day. We will launch it. Now, for that, the equipment was required. However, General Moon ran around, saw to it. The equipment landed, you won't believe, on the 12th of April, 1984, at 5 o'clock in the evening. And we had to launch the operations at early hours, the morning of the 13th. So, I was taken around on the helicopter for a recce to be shown what it is like on the 12th. And they said, I went around and saw my memories of 83 and it was all kept quiet. There was no movement whatsoever. And we were told that it would be radio silence. We will not communicate on uh, this thing. And that the company of Fokma and the major RS Sandhu, VRC, would be inducted with a platoon at Villa Fonda, or a platoon backup behind Villa Fonda, and the camp one, two, three logistic bases to be formed by another platoon. Another company of Ladakh Scouts under Major Bauguna would occupy Siala and they would occupy Camp 4, 5, 6 and that way. You'd be surprised to, to uh, for Mount Everest and to climb Mount Everest, you require only three camps. Camp 1, 2, 3 and you assault Mount Everest. Here for Siachi to get to Indra Kohl, it is Camp 1, Camp 2, Camp 3, Camp 4, Camp 5, Camp 6 and then you get to Indra Kohl. So it's a 76 kilometer long ratio which is about two to uh, five to six kilometers wide. It's very different. So I, I was taken on a recce and perfectly fine. We all decided, we knew, I knew who were to go. So it was a clear day. On the 13th April, early hours in the morning at about five o'clock, when the helicopters came and we were to be uh, dropped on Siachit. And it's the same lot of helicopters were then to be used for the platoon at Siala. So, uh, six odd helicopters that were with us would drop us at Villa Fondla, finish off that dropping, and then subsequently the same helicopters would be used 
for uh, dropping troops at uh, Siala. But as luck would have it, the pilot told me, and we were the first one. I was with my radio operator, another uh, helicopter. There were two of them. There were two boys who were with me in 1983. Uh, both, uh, and then it so happened that uh, the chopper came close and he said, uh, Kulkarni, uh, we can't land. I said, uh, you can't land? Uh, what happened? He said, no, we can't land. You jump. So I said, I don't mind jumping. But uh, to be able to jump, there's so many crevices in that area. I wouldn't know if I've jumped, whether I've jumped into the crevice, then you'll have another problem because I would have gone inside the crevice only. And it will be difficult. I said, I suggest what we do. We have some Arteka Bori with us. I'll we'll push the Arteka Bori down and we'll see the firmness and the hardness of the ice on the glacier. Based on that, I will jump. So he said, perfectly fine. So we dropped that. And uh, he poured low. He said, now it's okay. I said, I can jump. So I jumped. And so when I on the glacier, I found that I was perfectly fine. I hadn't sunk, so that means the thing was hard. And I gave him a thumbs up. I said, now you can land. Because my second was a radio operator. So obviously the radio operator could jump with his radio set. I could at least jump without anything. So then the chopper landed. This boy was the inductor. Mandal was his name. And we deinducted uh, uh, this thing. The second chopper, which had two more of uh, four more boys in it, uh, Prakash and another uh, uh, boy who was there. And then we found that they landed. Now, within about two, firstly, about in the first 40 minutes, only Mandal became a casualty. He said, I just can't breathe. I'm finding it extremely difficult. He said, my God, all these months we've been training ourselves so hard. And here we have within the first one hour only a casualty. How are we going to go ahead? And this boy became, he was evacuated and he saved because of the APO, right, evacuation by the choppers which are bringing the other troops. So we landed. By about 11.30, the weather suddenly turned extremely bad, unbelievable bad. Nothing could be seen. Yeah, blizzardous weather. It started snowing heavily. I think I said, what happened? All, it was perfectly fine today I landed. It was perfectly fine yesterday when I went for a reiki. And what's happened within uh, no time? Major R.S. Sandhu was bringing the last chopper with everybody. They all landed. We had small, small pop tents in which two people were to stay. And so such were well, 15 pop tents because you were a total of 30 people so put two, per pop tent so that two, 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 everybody could stay. And here the weather turned back. Now, because the weather turned back, the Siala platoon, which was to be heli dropped, because of uh, once these choppers from here were to be relieved, that couldn't be done because the weather had turned extremely bad. So that was the 13th, 14th, the weather was bad. 15th, the weather was bad. And on 15th, I get a report that this boy, one of our boys no more. I said, what, what happened? He was perfectly fine. So I think there's something wrong with him. I checked him, he was no more. So he had froth in his mouth, had suffered because of high altitude pulmonary edema. And it was all over, he, he died. Now, because he died, now there was very little that one could do at, at that point of time. So I said, let's open the radio set and be able to convey down below that one of our men are no more and that uh, he needs to be taken away from here and whatever we so. Now, this was only the third day. The orders were first five days, no radio opening. Because the moment you open the radio set, party will get to know because... Anybody will be monitoring. So it was quite clear. But whatever it is, I prevailed upon Major Sandhu and he said, okay, chalo, let's inform them. The moment they came, the weather, despite the bad weather, the chopper still came, picked up uh, this last night Ramesh and took him back. I was in the love for them. And guess as what it would be. When the radio sets were open, I was at Bill of Honor. I find right opposite me the Pakistani chopper with his pilot's eyes and my eye seeing one another. Because I was already at 18,000 plus. <laughs> the helicopter obviously could take up much of a height. So one could see each other's eye. And he saw me and I saw him. He took a quick U-turn and he took off. And now for Pakistan, the Siachin had been lost. Because now we were occupying the most important pass of Bila Fondla which they were hoping that they would come on the 1st of May. Now, this by the 13th of April and subsequent days, we were already entering into it. And by 17th of April, the weather cleared up. Soon as the weather cleared up, obviously, Siala also got occupied. So the two main routes of ingress, that was Bela Fondla and Siala, were held 
by India on the South Railway line. And Gyeongla, which was the subsequent very difficult, then got later occupied by 19 Kumar. So we had Gyeongla occupied, we had Gyeongla occupied, we had Sial occupied. Obviously, the Pakistani claims of Siachin were rubbish because they were nowhere close to Siachin. They were miles and miles away from Siachin. And since then, a lot of battles have taken place for the occupation of these heights in and around. But as they say in mountain, anybody who occupies heights, it's the defender's uh, paradise. You know, anybody who occupies heights and defends himself, there's nothing to lose. By then, Musharraf had become a brigadier. And he kept launching attacks on attacks on Balafondla, which he defeated and no, nothing they could do about it. In which you have Bana, who later got the Parambi Chakra at uh, Balafondla. So this is what it is all about. And uh, again, as I said, well, the troops were fine. Everything, good luck. And uh, I, I'm still alive and able to talk to you. <laughs> I think I, I, it's fantastic. I, I could be uh, And this is all more. hats I, off. I this is all hats off to the Indian infantry. Yeah, I think it's really wonderful. And uh, it's a lovely story you've told us, sir. And we'll really want to hear more about it later on. And uh, this is the first but not the last time. We'll continue with these sessions where we get to, you know, trouble you over your storytelling. You are a journalist delight, absolutely. <laughs> you know, it, it's so much of information and so much of fun to hear. And sir... Thank you very much for giving us your time on a very important day. And we hope to see you again, uh, sir. Jai Hind, sir. Have a very happy infantry day. And of course, a good, a very happy infantry day to the nation. Uh, the nation uh, also deserves a very happy infantry day. You know? So hats off to our up. army, sir. Hats off to the infantry. Right, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks. And thanks to Cyprus. God bless. Thank you so much, sir. It was very interesting to hear you. I was hearing the whole conversation. Thank you so much and uh, Jai Hind, sir. Have a great thank day. Thank you. Right, sir. Bye. Bye, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.